13-year-old Jesse is chatting online with a new friend. Innocent enough to start with, the conversation soon turns. Rather than another teenage girl, Jesse's talking online with a predatory paedophile, looking for his next victim. But then Jesse isn't for real either. She's actually a middle-aged police officer at the centre of an elaborate sting operation. Okay, let's go. I'm Mark Williams Thomas. For 12 years I worked as a police officer, specialising in child protection. But things have changed radically since then. Now I've been given extraordinary access to the Metropolitan Police paedophile unit. The picture of the, uh, the erect penis, is that a photograph that you have taken? I've been able to see firsthand their covert internet operations and the lengths they have to go to to catch a paedophile. Here in this anonymous office block in West London are the men and women of Scotland Yard's paedophile unit. Officers at the forefront of the fight against internet predators. He's been sentenced to a further 27 months for trying to interact with teenage girls again. They are policing the web at a time when the threat faced by our children is greater than ever. The man in charge is Detective Chief Inspector Nick Stevens. How has the problem today changed in the way that you tackle paedophiles? In terms of child abuse on the internet, the problem is huge, it's significant, not just for policing in London, but across the UK and across the world. The fact yeah. is, if I had three times the amount of staff tackling child abuse on the internet, yeah. I would still be struggling to cope with the demand. If you go back to five, ten years ago, the numbers of child abuse images that we were seizing, we'd be talking about thousands. Today, we're talking very much in the millions. Over an 18-month period, I was given unprecedented access to Nick Stevens' unit, following key members of his team. I got your uh, email about Dark Angel. Do we know of any children in the, in the house? Or... Detective Sergeant Jason Tunn has been here two years. He joined after working on Scotland Yard's anti-corruption unit. All right, thanks, Finn. Cheers. Bye. 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 Detective Inspector Dave Manning also joined the unit two years ago after spending three years fighting gun crime in the capital. My name is Nick Duffield. I'm a DS on the Met Paedophile Unit. And Detective Sergeant Nick Duffield has been with the unit for five years. He joined the Met after 16 years with Hertfordshire Police. But my journey started with this man, John Taylor. He's a covert internet investigator, or CII. Since 2005, a team of CIIs at the Met have been posing as young girls on social networking sites to try and flush out predatory paedophiles. Without a doubt, there are girls, there are boys out there who have met people, and my take on it, they've been raped. It's not a question of just having um, um, a sexual experience at a very young age. They've been raped, they've been duped, they've been groomed. That's what's actually occurred. That's what social networking sites allow because they allow the anonymity of the predatory paedophile to meet young children and go on to chat elsewhere and groom. John told me how recently he'd gone online pretending to be a 13-year-old girl 
Jessie. A nine-year-old girl had started talking to him in a chat room. She'd asked Jessie if she'd had any sexual experiences. The nine-year-old said she knew a man called Andy who could teach Jessie all about sex. Two weeks later, Andy came online. The conversation immediately turned sexual. He said he wanted to take Jessie's virginity. Police investigations have revealed that the nine-year-old girl doesn't exist and that Jesse, in reality John Taylor, has been talking with a sophisticated groomer. His name is Andrew Linton, a 55-year-old with no previous convictions. It's Friday afternoon and Linton's planned meeting with Jesse is just 72 hours away. We've been exchanging emails. I received the one today that he wants to meet on Monday at um, 11.30 at the park. Um, I want to get back on to him in, with an email to say how glad I am. Looking forward to Monday for the meet. But we also want to get a bit more information about him. We know who he is, but what we want to do is make sure we're in control of it, i.e., how are you travelling? How am I going to know it's you? So we just want to be safe and secure and control this meet rather than Andy Linton con controlling it. On a Friday afternoon, John Taylor, posing as 13-year-old Jesse, asks Linton what he'll be wearing for the date. Linton thinks Jesse's mum will be at work on Monday and she'll have the house to herself. It's Monday morning and John's colleague, DS Jason Tun, asked me to join him as a team of undercover officers made their way to the planned meeting place. So we've received an email at 10 past 6 this morning from uh, Andrew Linton, who's basically confirmed the meeting and said that he will be there for as close to 11.30. Let's give us a description of what he's going to be wearing so that we'll, we'll know it's him. And what do you know about Andrew Linton? We know that Andrew Linton is a man in his 50s. He's um, a married man. He lives in Hertfordshire. But obviously we don't know what, uh, what he does for a living. He tells us you know, that he's a scientist um, and that he also works in IT. But we don't know a great deal about him. Um, he's not known for, for any criminal offences. Um, so at the moment, you know, he's a bit of a blank canvas, really. What does he think is going to happen when he turns up today? He thinks today that uh, what, what he's specifically asked is whether our, our parents are out for the day and whether or not we can meet uh, in the park and then um, go back to the house of the, the undercover officer so that he can, uh, he can basically have penetrative sexual uh, activity with us. So we expect that he will turn up with some sort of condoms or something like that. I mean, that's really worrying, isn't it? It is. He's, uh, you know... Uh, he's clearly a dangerous person. I mean, the, the fact that he's, you know, he's now using you know, a number of identities, you know, in order to to orchestrate what is quite a, uh, a, a cunning grooming process shows how dangerous the man is. Linton has sent a description of what he's wearing to what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl. His planned meeting place, a busy South London park with a kids' playground. We arrive an hour early, and other officers are already in place. As we wait, Jason Tun spots our man. From Jason, all units be aware, we have a potential subject. All units wait. This is our first sight of Linton. In a matter of seconds, he will discover Jesse doesn't exist, and he's at the centre of an elaborate police sting operation. In South London, police officers lay in wait for a predatory paedophile. A man has been grooming what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl for sex. In reality, his conversations have been with an undercover officer. Now he has arrived at a bustling park, hoping to meet his victim. All 
all units confirm this is the subject. Um, I'm here on the day out. Are you? Hey. Hello. What sort of birds have you come from? Um, Hertfordshire. Um, now, don't tell me what you're really doing here. You've not come on a day out, have you? You know that we're here because we know what you're here for. Understand me? So why are you here? Um, I arranged to meet someone. And who did you arrange to meet? A girl called Jessie. Is that where you want me to stay? Okay. You're going to be arrested, OK? It's attempting to meet a girl following sexual grooming. Okay? Can you actually tell me what happened? What happened? How do you mean? Well, was the girl I was talking to Sting? That will be something we will go into later on, okay? Okay. The detectives discover condoms in his pockets. Stick them in the, uh, stick them in the vulva. Yeah. make my way to Charing Cross Police Station to meet officers taking Andrew Linton into custody. This gentleman has been arrested by me at five past eleven this morning uh -huh. for the offence of attempting to meet a girl following sexual grooming. Have you understand why you've been arrested? Yes. Okay, I'm going to authorise your detention here so that this officer can investigate the allegation made against you by questioning or by other means. Understand? Yes. And do anybody inform that you're here? Um, I, I understand my wife will be informed as a course of the investigation. Yeah, we're going to be doing a section 18 yes. search if, if granted, so what we intend to do is inform his wife once we get to the house. Okay, well, so no one else. Yeah, well, we will, we'll we'll ask this officer to search you now, okay? So if you... Uh, Are you concealing anything on you? From my own experience working as a detective, I know that this is when the real work begins. If you're going to investigate these people and investigate them properly, which it needs to be done, you know, because these are serious offences, it is a lot of work. You know, the, the easy bit really at the end of the day is, is getting to the point where you arrest these people. It's when the arrest happens, that's when the work starts. You know, you've got to prepare the case file, you've got to get the telephones examined, you get the computers examined. You've got to look at all the images. You've got to see what other offenders are on, already on that computer. If there's other victims, you're looking at a, a whole separate investigation. Um, and if you multiply that by the amount of prisoners that, are on, that, we, that we deal with on this unit, then you're talking about a phenomenal amount of work. At this stage, police have no idea how serious an offender Andrew Linton could be. Would you have actually gone back to a child's house today? That would have been up to her. If she said it was OK, would you have gone? Um, yes. I'm going to put it to you, Andy, that you have manipulated this whole scenario very cunningly in order to groom a 13-year-old child on the internet so that you can find out exactly what is going on in that child's head and that you are in total control of that situation from the beginning right through to the end. Do you accept that you've been manipulative? Uh, I accept that the evidence looks that way and I accept that there is a degree but um, uh, it was much more of a roller coaster ride going along with the fantasy. I really I really didn't feel that I was just manipulating this girl. It just it just happened. But you say it, but you say it's a fantasy, Andy, but fantasy is not <coughs> stepping out of your front door, turning up in London with three condoms in your pocket. I know. Is it? No, it isn't. As the interview continues, other officers are making their way to Linton's home to seize his computer. Can you tell me how many images you have at home and what they are? I'm not talking adult pornography, I'm talking pornography involving children. Um, 
pictures of girls that I, I, I've been sent, um, lots. I couldn't put a number to it. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, no, I couldn't put a number to it. Okay. Actual um, videos of, uh, of acts with children, um, I don't know, a couple of dozen. Okay. Do any of the videos involve very young children, or is that just still images that you're talking about? Um, I think there's one that involves a baby, which isn't, isn't very nice. I would later discover that Linton's offending was far more serious than it first seemed. But for many, Linton appears to be the epitome of middle-class respectability. I'd learned the married IT professional was even Oxford educated. Not the image most of us have of a paedophile. Back at the office, I caught up with Detective Chief Inspector Nick Stevens to find out more about the type of men his officers have arrested since these covert operations began. There is this perception, this stereotypical image of the paedophile, you know, the man wearing the, the coat, but that's not the reality, is it? No, certainly the internet has shown, and the people that are arrested have shown, that people who are committing offences, the paedophiles, the sex offenders, can come from any walk of life. Certainly over the last couple of years, we've arrested magistrates, lawyers, company directors, police officers, people who are working within the media, along with the type of individual that you've just uh, spoken about, the unemployed man, the 40-year-old single male still living with, with mum and dad. It can be literally anybody who is committing sexual offences against children. Increasingly, Nick Stevens' team are relying on cutting-edge technology to both trace the victims of abuse and to help identify offenders. Recently, officers from the unit have discovered indecent images at the home of a Kent businessman, Dean Hardy. Some of the images seized show a man's hand abusing a young girl. They believe that man is 50-year-old Hardy. But building the case against him rests on using groundbreaking forensic techniques. Last September, we executed a search warrant at his home address. DS Nick Duffield is leading the investigation. All you could see in the photograph um, was the hands of the abuser. So what we then did was we sought authority to photograph his hands. Um, we then took that photograph with the photograph from the image we'd recovered uh, and we went to seek out an expert in relation to hand identification or, or marks, uh, blemishes on hands that uh, could be compared with the offender's hands. Nick Duffield believes the photos were taken when Hardy, a furniture salesman, visited Thailand in 2004. But proving it's his hand in the photos abusing a young Asian girl rests on expert evidence. This is a picture of the hand that was touching the girl's genitalia. In the background there's a number of photographs... A member of the adults. team talks uh, through the case like with Wednesday Crown Prosecution uh, lawyer Arwell Jones. Southeast Asian origin. And you can see this image here. It's a picture of a, uh, a young Could girl... Could the hand evidence help secure a conviction? It's a picture of a naked Southeast Asian female. It's difficult to say the age um, mm. because it's only a shot of, of there's, no, there's no facial shot there. But what it does clearly show is an adult male hand touching the genitalia of this young girl. Right. And here, as I go through the slides, the picture on the right marked with an S is Mr Hardy's hand. Right. And that's the photograph we took of his hands when he gave us his consent. Mm. She's highlighted three points here which are identical on those hands. And it's effectively the, the pigmentation and the marking 
of the scarring. That's right, yeah, she's identified a scar on. on the left index finger as well of the offender's hand. Right. And, and as you can see, like you say, the pigmentation and freckling is, is identical. Mm. OK, I'm going to need to uh, take this report away and read it in some detail. Sure. But certainly, uh, on the face of it, it seems an interesting, yeah. an unusual source of evidence, but maybe a, a compelling source of evidence. My preliminary view at this stage would be that this case really does hinge on this expert evidence. It's clear the lengths police will go to to secure a conviction. But will this new hand recognition technology be enough to convict Hardy? This type of expert evidence is new territory. If this case is successful, it could be a useful tool in other paedophile cases, not just within the Met, but for forces around the world. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the unit, the covert internet investigations are continuing. John Taylor is online, posing as Becky, a 13-year-old schoolgirl. He's been talking with a man called Andrew Smith. Some paedophiles spend months carefully grooming victims. Others, like Smith, are blatant from the start. He quickly suggests a meeting with Becky. In later online chats, he goes still further. Finally, after three months, he sends what he thinks is a 13-year-old girl a webcam picture of himself masturbating. Nick Dufford asked me to join him in South London. He told me Smith was on his way to meet Becky. His team are in position in a nearby cafe. Andrew Smith doesn't know it yet, but he's about to walk straight into an elaborate police trap. Nick Duffield and his team are in position outside a cafe on a busy South London road. They're about to arrest a predatory paedophile who's expecting to meet a 13-year-old girl for sex. Nick Duffield asks us to hang back until his team have secured their target. He can't take any chances that the man, Andrew Smith, spots us and flees. Finally, three o'clock on a Thursday afternoon, Officers move in for an arrest. Can you call a car up for us, please? This is Andrew Smith, a London businessman who sent images of himself masturbating to what he thought was a 13-year-old girl. At London's Charing Cross Police Station, Smith is initially held in a waiting area before being taken into a custody suite. Mr Smith has been um, engaging in uh, internet chats um, since about February time to what he believed to be a 13-year-old girl. On the 25th of um, May, he um, masturbated to um, his webcam, intending, believing it to be viewed by the 13-year-old um, girl. And at five minutes past three this afternoon, I myself arrested him for attempting to meet a girl under the age of 16 following sexual grooming and also for the defence of attempting to cause a child age 13 to view a sexual act. Well, I'm going to authorise your detention here so this matter can be fully investigated. Later, in police interviews, Andrew Smith initially said he had no intention of having sex with Becky. I've travelled there today to have a coffee with Becky and basically to tell her not to meet people off the internet because she seemed like a nice girl. Um, I'd absolutely no intention of doing anything whatsoever with her. 
But yeah, obviously I said some things I, I, I shouldn't have. Is that all, all that took place? Um, yeah, I did masturbate on, on cam once. Why did you do that? Just, just for a sort of laugh. I mean, didn't, obviously didn't mean to defend her or anything like that. Two months later, I caught up with Nick Duffield to discuss the Andrew Smith case. At his work address, we found um, this cigarette packet, um, and in there, I don't know if you can um, you can see, but there's a there's a digital camera, um, and within that cigarette packet, he's made uh, holes in there, which um, allowed him to take pictures, um, unbeknown to um, the person he was photographing. Um, and on his computer, we found a series of images that had been taken on the underground. So, um, all, albeit these weren't of children, these were of um, adult females, but quite clearly a deviant act which um, needed further investigation. Andrew Smith pleaded guilty to attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming and inciting a child to watch sexual acts over the internet. No further action was taken over the photographs. He was jailed for a year and will be on the sex offenders register for 10 years. But after serving just six months of his sentence, Smith was released for good behaviour. Six months for travelling to meet someone that effectively he would have raped, it seems to me to be absolutely not in line with what the person should have got. Well, that is a, that's a matter for the courts. It's not for me to comment on that. Um, the judge has his guidelines. He has to take into account um, early guilty pleas. Um, he has to take into account that this, this guy is previously good character. Um, but it's a matter for the sentencing judge. Smith is clearly a dangerous internet predator. But I wonder how many more men like him are trawling the net to meet teenage girls for sex. We're watching people coming to meet who they think are young children. How many times do they meet real young children that aren't undercover officers? The honest answer when we're talking about <coughs> groomers, when we're talking about paedophiles, sex offenders who are actively committing direct offences against children, there's nobody anywhere in the world in law enforcement who can give an honest answer in relation to the figures. I can sit here and say that in relation to people who are downloading images, distributing images, we're talking about tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of individuals within the UK. But the people who are committing the most serious offences, those who are in networks, I cannot say and give any sort of answer in relation to how many are committing those offences. And that has to be extremely concerning in itself. The Met's covert internet investigations generate almost three quarters of the work carried out by the unit. Social networking sites and internet service providers are already working with the government to try and keep children safe. Given the apparent explosion in the number of paedophiles online, I wonder if the internet is actually responsible for a growth in offending. Where there are children, there will be people looking to exploit them, so we have to take precautions to reduce that risk. We don't simply have to worry about the sex offenders, we have to be home. I joined other parents at an internet safety seminar. They want to know how to keep their children safe when they're online. Realistic about it. The law in this land says... The man leading the seminar is Donald Finlater, head of Stop It Now, a campaign set up to help offenders and their victims. I think the internet brings so many kind of positives to our lives and to the lives of children uh, and of course there's no turning back the clock and I wouldn't wish to but it also brings lots of dangers with it and lots of opportunities that people are seizing. I genuinely believe that yes there are thousands and thousands of people in the UK who have chosen to look and who probably today are still choosing to look at or for child pornography. So, some of those people will also be looking to make contact with children through that technology and will be doing that with, with a view to physically getting in touch with children and potentially even sexually abusing them. In the pre-internet days, rather a lot of those people would not have thought to do some of those things. It wouldn't have occurred to them, the opportunity wouldn't have been there. So whilst I, I don't want to blame the internet, it, it's opened, opened a door really and said these things are becoming possible.
I received a call from Detective Sergeant Nick Duffield. He told me he had some good news. Remember Dean Hardy? The man they believed had photographed himself abusing a young girl in Thailand? When faced with the full weight of evidence against him, including the hand identification work, he changed his plea to guilty. I caught up with Nick Duffield at Southern Crown Court as Hardy was sentenced. Initially, Hardy had uh, made a no-comment interview. He'd, he'd, he'd uh, opted not to cooperate with us. However, when he was confronted with that evidence, he admitted that he had been there. He'd certainly been in the room when those photographs were taken. Uh, and he was in two minds. He couldn't decide whether to admit to us that, yes, that was his hand. I think he wanted to wait to see if the Crown Prosecution Service were going to support um, the evidence that we had and charge him with these offences. Uh, and I think it shows that... Um, we will stop at no opportunity to identify individuals that seek to abuse, sexually abuse children, whether it's in this country or whether it's abroad. Hardy confessed to two charges of indecent assault on girls under the age of 14 and a string of child abuse charges. He was sentenced to six years in jail and will be on the sex offenders register for life. Back in the unit, covert internet investigators have been contacted by someone calling himself Dave. He says he's 27. He thinks he's talking to a 14-year-old girl called Shelley. In later conversations, he's even more explicit. He's told Shelley he wants to meet her, but he's nervous. Investigations have revealed the man calling himself Dave is in fact David Corcoran, a man with a previous conviction for downloading indecent images of children. He has agreed to meet Shelley at one of London's busiest railway stations. I joined DI Dave Manning as officers made their way to the meeting point. Yeah, Jason, we'll see you Dave. For some time now he's talked about travelling, but he hasn't travelled, has he, up until today for some reason? He intimated recently that um, he, he wanted to travel, but he was concerned that we may not be who we say we are, um, that you know, police do investigations on the internet and there, there's some sort of trap. Yesterday we managed to reassure him that we were who um, we say we are. Within a very short period of time after that, he'd, um, he sent us a, a picture via the internet of this erect penis, said, Greg, looking forward to tomorrow. Um, he's brought forward his um, travel time as the earliest possible train he could get to travel to London. Um, he's on that train now, um, due in at Euston in about an hour and a quarter's time. Corcoran doesn't know it, but undercover officers from the Lancashire Force are on the train with him. Police can't take the risk that he assaults a real girl as he makes his way to London to meet Shelley. But at Euston, there's a problem. The train's been delayed until 12.26 now as an estimated time arrival, so that's five minutes' time. Um, we know he's still on the train, he's been sending us messages over the last hour, hour and a okay. half of a, a graphic nature asking us what we're wearing under our skirt, that sort of thing, you know, so he's clearly still teed up from the, the, the uh, sexual angle, so... Jess, just left Watford Junction. But at the very last minute, there's a change of plan. What now? This one. Platform 13. The train will arrive at a different platform, at the opposite end of the station.
There are just minutes to go until the train arrives. Ian, just in case you didn't know, mate, they've changed the platform. It's platform 13 now. Yeah, 13, they've just changed it. Detective Inspector Dave Manning and his team are at London's Euston Station. That's all right. It's not in yet. Predatory paedophile David Corcoran is due to arrive in minutes to meet who he thinks is a 14-year-old girl called Shelley. So, Dave, we've just had to quickly move from the other platform where we thought the train was coming in at. It's now coming in at platform 13. What's he wearing? What's the latest description? Um, well, he's wearing, he's wearing a brown khaki jacket blue shirt, uh, blue jeans and brown shoes. It's curly hair um, and, it's, and glasses as well, as you've seen from the picture of him. But uh, the picture we've got of him appears to be his hair's cut shorter than it is at the moment. But otherwise, it, it's a uh, good likeness. The train arrives over an hour late. Corcoran doesn't know it, but he has undercover officers following him along the platform. Jason Tun and DC Caroline Bartle get ready for the arrest. Is that him? I'm not sure which one he is. Oh, yeah, yeah, I've got him, I've got him. Come on, David Corcoran. Come over here. Get your hands on. Go, 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 it's a coffee, you know. Pardon? Coffee. Coffee? I changed my mind. I said I shouldn't be doing it. I said it to say such a thing. Right, OK, I'm arresting you for attempting to cause a child to watch a sexual act. Oh, I'm not doing it. Just listen to this officer. Inciting a child to engage in sexual activity and travelling to meet a child following sexual grooming. You don't have to say anything, but it may harm your defence if you do not mention when question something which you later write in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Do you understand? Yeah, do you have any knives on you? Any syringes, no, no, needles, no, any sharp no. instruments? Jason carries out a quick body search on Corcoran, checking for both dangerous items and any evidence. Okay. Okay. Let's go. Okay. All right. He's led away by police officers through the crowds at Euston Station. Finally, David Corcoran is driven off to Charing Cross Police Station. Okay, can I take your surname, please? It's Corcoran. Right, can I get someone to give him a quick search, yeah. please? <coughs> Jason carries out a more detailed search. Two sealed condoms are found in Corcoran's wallet. You are nearly 28 years old, so a child half your age. Why are you sending her that type of photograph? No During police interview, Corcoran refused to speak as the allegations were read out to him. That your pattern of offending, your sexual offending pattern, has got worse. Would you agree to that or not? No comment. Because having gone from looking at things on the internet downloading child pornography from the internet is one thing. Travelling half the length of the country in order to have sex with a child is a completely different thing. Do you not agree to that? 
I'd agree to what you said. Okay. Well, I'll ask you to look at that there. Okay. Mm -hmm. It says image 0707208.jpg. Yes? Okay. That's what it says. That's what it says. Okay, lovely. Is that a photograph that you have taken with your mobile telephone? No problem. Okay. <coughs> Later at court, David Corcoran pleaded guilty to attempting to meet a child following sexual grooming, inciting a child to watch sexual acts over the internet, and inciting a child to commit sexual activity. He was jailed for two years and will be on the sex offenders register for ten. It seems clear to me that had Corcoran met a real 14-year-old girl at Euston Station that day, the girl would have been at serious risk. Can you ask me to ring Jason Tum from the paedophile unit? It's just in relation, she wanted some assistance around um, some images that she recovered the other week. So she Members of the unit are dealing with offenders like Corcoran day in, day out. I wanted to know what advice they would give to parents. Nick, a key element of safeguarding children has to be education. Mm -hmm. And education very much coming from parents. What would you say to parents, some of those top tips, mm. advice you would give them? Um, talk, to, talk to your children about the dangers of being on the internet. Share with them press cuttings, show them TV programmes. Let's not hide away from the fact that there are individuals out there that are prepared to sexually abuse children via the internet. Secondly, have your home computer or whichever computer it is that's accessing the internet in a public area, if you like, in an area um, where the parents, older brothers and sisters are going to walk past. Say to your child, I'm not going to monitor you, but be prepared for me just to walk up occasionally and say, tell me who that individual is that you're talking to. And if you can't, then there's going to be some, um, some fallout from that. The full horror of the threat posed by internet predators was about to be brought home to me. Detective Sergeant Jason Tun told me he had an update on another case. Remember Andrew Linton, the IT professional from Hertfordshire? who had wanted to meet 13-year-old Jesse in a London park. After examining his computers, police discovered almost 20,000 indecent images of children. They also found video clips of a man abusing a 17-month-old baby. The man in the video clips was Andrew Linton. When we searched his house, obviously, apart from recovering the indecent images, we also found that there were nappies, children's nappies, that were actually in the house. And when the officers looked at those, we'd noticed that they were actually opened. And when we spoke to Mr Linton about them, he told us that he was, uh, he was interested in uh, the wearing of nappies and nappy technologies. He felt it helped him connect to being um, towards a younger child. So obviously that was a great concern to us. Um, but more worryingly, really, and it's something that the judge commented upon today, was the 600 or so story files that we found on Mr Linton's computer. And I've read some of those, those, um, those logs, and they are... Uh, horrendous, uh, to be honest. The, the ones that were highlighted to the court uh, graphically illustrate and show how uh, fantasy stories that are downloaded from the internet by Mr Linton and other people like him, and the ones that Mr Linton had depicted the rape and eventual murder of a four-year-old child by her father. We've shown that Mr Linton's sexual interest in children has, has spanned the last decade and he's operated on the internet with complete anonymity until now. It was only really through our deployment of our covert internet investigator on this, on this particular police operation that we came across Mr Linton. Had we not done that type of operation, then it's, it's highly likely that Mr Linton would still be out there uh, operating on the internet, distributing you know, horrific images of children being abused with other paedophiles. Linton pleaded guilty to the indecent assault on the baby and 30 other charges, including his attempt to meet a child following sexual grooming. He was jailed indefinitely and will be on the sex offenders register for life. During my time with the paedophile unit, I've discovered just how vital their covert operations are. I mean, it says it's having got more people coming in, it goes on and on. The vast majority of the predators caught in these stings like Andrew Linton have no previous convictions and weren't known to the police. 
But I was about to discover that these weren't the only covert internet operations run by the unit. Coming up next week, DI Dave Manning is on the trail of a family man who's been trying to procure a 12-year-old girl for sex. We follow detectives to Europe as they investigate a criminal gang peddling child porn on the net. And the covert internet arrests continue. <laughs>